Well, welcome back. Uh, balloons are the oldest form of flight, dating back to 1873 in Paris, where then American diplomats Ben Franklin and John Adams witnessed man floating in the atmosphere for the first time. 236 years later, we have stealth bombers, drones, and promises of regular commercial space flights. Let's just hope when that happens, those flights have more leg room than what we experience on the commercial airliners today. Even though commercial airline comfort hasn't advanced, balloon flight certainly has. Please welcome our next guest, Aerostar's Sean Turgeon, for Lighter Than Air Innovation. Sean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. I've never worn an ear microphone, so I feel as though I should be on a, an infomercial, uh, but this works. Good morning. As Vernon mentioned, my name is Sean Turgeon. I am a program manager at Raven Aerostar, one of three unique operating divisions that consists of Raven as a whole, headquartered in downtown Sioux Falls. Raven Aerostar connects, protects, and saves lives. That is our mission. And it's my objective today to illustrate how we accomplish that mission through our groundbreaking technology, primarily in stratospheric balloon platforms, radar sensors, and tethered aerostats. Raven is a publicly traded corporation, and just real quickly for context and protection, I have the safe harbor statement up here to uh, offer protection on any forward-looking statements. Don't want to spend any more uh, time uh, dwelling on that. This morning, you're going to get an overview of Raven Industries, as well as a spotlight on our unique technologies, as I've mentioned, balloons, radar sensors, and tethered aerostats. And if time permits, I would like to allow for some Q&A, just so that we can have some good engagement and collaboration between us. For over 60 years, Raven has leveraged innovation and ideation to solve the world's greatest challenges. In 1956, four men incorporated Raven at the corner of 6th and Phillips Avenue in downtown Sioux Falls in what was then a biscuit bakery. And over our 60 plus year history, we have endured and evolved into what we are today. Three unique operating divisions serving three unique markets with three very unique product mixes. We have 1,300 employees that span our global footprint. We have multiple locations here in the States, but we also have a presence in Canada, multiple presences in Europe, as well as Brazil. And as I mentioned previously, offhand, we are publicly traded, have been since the late 70s, and trade on the NASDAQ. As I mentioned, Raven consists of three unique sister divisions. Raven Applied Technology feeds a growing world. And they do this by leveraging precision agriculture technology to feed a growing population. In essence, they automate functions of the farming process to help farmers reduce input, increase output, and therefore feed a growing world. Raven Engineered Films manufactures and designs extremely large extruded plastic sheeting and tarps for a variety of applications construction, geomembrane, industrial, energy, drilling, natural disaster relief etc. And then there's Raven Aerostar. Raven Aerostar really is what Raven was at its inception. All things lighter than air, all things high altitude balloons. But over our 60 year history, we truly have evolved into a very diversified strategic division within Raven. Now on this slide, you're going to hear and see some products, programs, names that maybe you're unfamiliar with, and that's fine. I want to cover much of this in greater length as I continue on. So if you have your furrowed eyebrows and you're not so sure, don't worry about it for now. These are some historical milestones that I just want to cover. In 1959, Raven manufactured a 6 million cubic foot balloon that broke the world altitude record at 150,000 feet. That truly is the edge of space, and it truly is quite an accomplishment for the late 50s. In the 70s, Raven began working with the National Science Foundation to deliver balloons in support of near space scientific experimentation and research. And that program later transitioned into NASA. So today we have a nearly four, four decade long relationship with NASA that continues to endure uh, in a very healthy manner. In 2010, we initiated our deliveries of TIFF 25K aerostat systems, which I'll cover here later, uh, in support of US efforts abroad in Afghanistan. In 2012, we became the, the exclusive manufacturing partner of Google's audacious moonshot, Project Loon, which is a project centered around delivering remote connectivity and internet connection to remote parts of the world through the use of stratospheric balloons. 
In 2012, we also acquired Raven Aerostar Technical Solutions, a wholly owned subsidiary headquartered in Arlington, Virginia. And with that acquisition, we bolted on over three decades of radar sensors and advanced signal processing core competency and capabilities into our division, diversifying our product mix even further. And today, we continue to be a leader in innovating and in providing excellence in the defense and aerospace markets. Objectively speaking, there is not another organization in the world with the number of days we have in the stratosphere, well over 10,000. Raven Aerostar is the world leader in stratospheric balloon platforms. Now, I hesitate to share that because oftentimes, uh, especially in a context like this, it, it sounds like a sales pitch. But objectively speaking, those words are non-refutable in our market space. There is not another organization with the core competencies, the experience, and the number of days that we have in the high altitude arena. I actually want to go back. I want to provide some context here. So when I say stratosphere, oftentimes there's a haze in terms of what I'm referencing. So when I say stratosphere, think above fixed wing aircraft, but below satellites. There's an operational gap in that sphere that only a few platforms are capable of operating in. And when I say we have stratospheric balloon platforms that do a variety of things, oftentimes it's tough to understand what that means. Our balloons are like pickup trucks in the sky. We carry payloads, radar sensors, cameras, electronic boxes, you, you name it. We carry payloads of all different shapes and sizes to the edge of space for a period of time. And when that mission is deemed complete or over, we bring those payloads back down to Earth safely. We've done this for decades for a variety of organizations, some of which I'll touch on here this morning. As I mentioned, we have a nearly four decade long relationship with NASA that continues to endure today. We provide large and small super pressure and zero pressure balloons in support of near space experimentation and scientific research. Now, when I say large balloons, I want to offer context. We make a 39 million cubic foot balloon. It's a bread and butter. 39 million cubic feet means that when it's inflated, it can hold 39 million cubic feet of helium. Now, when that balloon is fully inflated at altitude, you could fit Howard Wood Football Stadium and the adjacent parking lots within that balloon up at 120,000 feet. So that's the scale that I'm talking about when I reference a large balloon. When you lay these out, they are over 700 feet long. That's over two football fields. This picture that you see here is actually a launch that we did in, in collaboration with NASA in New Zealand. And you can see the scale at which this balloon is laid out and partially inflated at the same time. And as you can imagine, we carry extremely expensive and extremely heavy payloads to the edge of space. And so there's an imbalance in terms of how heavy we as the balloon can be relative to the weight of the payload. So if you were to feel the fabric of these, of these materials, if you were to go down Russell Avenue to the Raven Aerostar production facility right off, right, just uh, south of the airport, and you were to go to our scrap bin and feel some of this material, think dry cleaner bag. Think thinner than a Ziploc bag. That's the, that's the thickness, the, the lack of thickness, uh, better said, of these balloons. And that's the level of, of detail from a design, engineering, manufacturing, and iteration standpoint that our team takes when we deliver these products and ship them out the door. As I referenced as well, we did partner with Google in 2012, and we became the sole manufacturing balloon provider for their audacious moonshot project loon. So I want to provide some context here. Google took a look years ago and they said, two thirds of the world does not have internet connectivity. How can we solve that gap? And the idea proposed for Project Loon was to use stratospheric balloons to carry payloads that have broadband and internet connectivity capabilities into the stratosphere. in a constellation of balloons, not, not a singular quantity one balloon, but a constellation. And when these balloons are up in the stratosphere, they can communicate with each other, sending beams back and forth as well as sending beams back down to the ground and therefore providing coverage over an area that previously did not there have it. We've flown thousands of flights, millions of miles. We've had balloons last well over 200 days. And this is truly a capability that's continuing to grow, uh, improve itself as something that can be a value add to many regions. There have been pilot tests in the aftermath of several natural disasters. We reference here Brazil, Peru, and Puerto Rico. In the aftermath of several natural disasters, our, our balloons, in conjunction with Google, have provided coverage, gigabytes of data being transferred from the stratosphere back down to the ground so that people can respond, communicate, and get coverage. I'm going to take a sip of water here, so I do apologize. My, my voice would start giving out here, and you wouldn't want to hear that. 
So we do have a wide variety of stratospheric balloon platforms. One of the most cutting edge from our perspective is our Thunderhead balloon systems. This is a product that's specifically catered at the time being for the defense market, and it has groundbreaking applications, and we're very bullish on where this technology can take us. So what is a Thunderhead balloon system? A Thunderhead balloon system is a high altitude balloon that leverages directional wind patterns in the stratosphere to achieve navigation and persistence. So in other words, this is a balloon that we can launch from point A, navigate to point B, and once we are in point B, we can retain persistence over that area. And when the mission's over, we can cut the balloon and bring the payload back down to Earth safely. This is a groundbreaking capability and a groundbreaking solution to an, to an existing operational gap within the defense market. We have some applications listed here from an intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, communications, beyond line of sight communications. Let's imagine a scenario where there's a GPS denied environment. You could put some position navigation time equipment on this balloon, rapidly deploy it, and you could have locations and coordinates uh, in a rapid fashion. Groundbreaking capabilities uh, that I want to touch on here at a deeper level. So how does this work? So the winds, the stratosphere is called the stratosphere because the winds are stratified. They go in opposite directions like this. So at different altitude levels, you have winds going in opposite directions. So for us to navigate from point A to point B, for us to go left and right, we want to go up and down. And to go up and down, we need to make ourselves heavier or lighter. And to make ourselves heavier or lighter, we have a few things on board that help us achieve that, that goal. When you look at a Thunderhead balloon, you see a balloon, and you might see some electronics near the bottom. But what you don't see in an obvious fashion is that within that balloon is a smaller balloon. I'll call it a ballonet. Also on board is a blower. So if I want to descend to obtain a different altitude directional wind, I can command that blower to turn on. And it'll blow air into that internal balloon, making the balloon heavier and causing me to descend. If I want to go back up to achieve a different altitude layer, I can vent that air out that I just blew in, making me lighter, and I ascend back up. And we do all the command and control on the ground, and I'll hit that here later. But that's the method by which we achieve navigation and persistence. And we just delicately and strategically repeat that process over and over until the mission's complete. What you see here are a couple of snapshots of our Thunderstorm command and control interface. This is a command and control interface that our software team has developed specifically for our flight engineers uh, so that when they're on the ground in a control room, they can communicate and talk to our balloons at 65, 90, 100,000 feet in the sky. Depending on the layout that you want to see, you can see the different balloon. Um, you can see where the balloon has been. You can see where the balloon is going to go based on our predictions and models. You can see what the winds are doing at different layers of the altitude. You can also see a Google map similar like interlay. So we have a couple of options here, as well as countless metrics of what the balloon is doing and the status of that balloon. The location, the speed, the GPS coordinates, what's the temperature at altitude, etc. Our engineers take all of this data, compile it, and continue to make informed decisions about how to continue this mission onward and achieve navigation and persistence over an area of interest. Now, I hesitated uh, largely to include this, this slide in this presentation because it is a bit of a headache, so I do apologize ahead of time. But it offers a lot of context in terms of a concept of operations and what does this look like real time. So I'm going to walk you through this, uh, and hopefully it isn't as uh, confusing as it might seem. Off on the left-hand side, you see a box that says Launch Site. This is where we would take a customer payload, integrate it with our balloon so that on a mechanical and electrical interface uh, perspective, it communicates in the fashion that we want it to communicate. This location could be Baltic, South Dakota, where Raven has its Raven Innovation Campus. It's where our flight hangar is, and we're launching balloons out of there every week. It could be at a customer-determined location anywhere in the continental US. So this is where we would integrate the payload and launch the balloon. Once that balloon is launched, it would enter the first stage, the transit stage. This is where we are, we are conducting multiple maneuvers up and down, up and down, very strategically to reach an area of interest. And once we're there, we would enter what we call the, the station keeping stage or the loop back stage. It's a multiple, it's, a, it's, a, it's subsequent stages in and of itself because we are conducting maneuvers in and over an area to retain persistence there. Depending on the application, depending on the payload, that's going to determine what we are attempting to accomplish, but that's what we're going to be um, executing. 
And then once we determine that the mission is complete, we are going to enter a final transit stage into an area where we would call our, our uh, recovery uh, location. So when we terminate a balloon, we cut the balloon. We send a communication up to the balloon. It cuts the balloon. A, a parachute deploys. We manufacture those parachutes in Madison, South Dakota. And down comes the very expensive and very capable payload at a very safe and reasonable speed where our flight recovery team is out in the field waiting for it to, to descend into a field in a safe location where we pick it up. That is really what a concept of operations looks like. So if we have a balloon up in the stratosphere for dozens and dozens of days, we have individuals on the ground monitoring, tracking, controlling that balloon for dozens and dozens of days and nights. And we're making sure that there are 24-7 eyes on this balloon to make sure that the mission is being accomplished. As I mentioned previously, in 2012, we acquired a company out of Arlington, Virginia, that brought on decades of radar sensor hardware as well as advanced signal processing capabilities into our division. Now, for those that are familiar with radars, you, you're, you're aware of the fact that this is not a new technology. Radars have been around for decades. But Raven Aerostar has a unique take on radars that help us achieve our mission of connecting, protecting, and saving lives. Now, I do want to level set before I continue here. We don't build and deliver fish finder radars for when you're fishing up on the Missouri River. We don't build and deliver weather radars. What we build and deliver primarily are radars that are catered for situational awareness, persistent surveillance, and threat detection. So we have radars that perceive the world around it, and they can catch bad people in bad places, send that data back to a control room, and forces can respond appropriately. Typically, these, these do have commercial applications, but specifically, this is catered to the defense market to protect and support the warfighter. And we stand behind our products very strongly. So, like I said, there are many different types of radars. They've been around for a long time. And within this specific market, they come in all different shapes, sizes, colors, names. But one thing is typically a common denominator baseline, and that is prohibitively high cost. Now, where we come in in our value proposition is that we offer high performing and unique capabilities at best value. So our business model and our approach is we take very economical commercial off-the-shelf hardware, but we infuse that hardware with extremely sophisticated algorithms and advanced signal processing capabilities. And when you marry those two things together, you get a system that often outperforms systems at 5x, 10x the price at, a very, at best value, simply put. Our systems can be deployed on towers, on vehicles, on boats, on land, on vehicles. They can be deployed in land, sea, and air environments. They can operate in all different weather conditions. And oftentimes, from our customers, we get a couple of, feedback. We get a couple of notes of feedback that are, that are repetitive. One is that they're extremely simple to use and extremely effective. But the second one is that the tracks that, we, that our radars pick up are extremely clean and extremely reliable and have extremely low false alarm rates. So when I say track, and I'm referencing a radar that is perceiving a world over a fixed geographic region, it could be a person, it could be a boat, it could be a vehicle, it could be something going over a border, it is the eyes for a group of people, a control room, if you will, allowing forces to respond appropriately. Our radar systems deploy globally. We are on US Navy vessels as we speak that are out at sea. We are along the Jordanian border on towers that are providing protection and surveillance for individuals potentially crossing that border. We are on autonomous vessels. We're on non-autonomous vessels at sea. We're on aerostats in the South China Sea. We have a global presence, and we continually, day in and day out, support and protect the warfighter, and that is the business that we are in. One emerging trend in the economy as a whole right now is autonomy, and it's no different than in the radar realm. Now, when you reference autonomy and autonomous uh, capabilities with reference to radars, we call it an autonomous perception system. So what is that? An autonomous perception system is when you have a boat. Typically, this is in a maritime environment. So autonomous perception is when you have a boat at sea, but there's nobody on that boat. But there is somebody back on land in a control room. And the only way that that person in a control room can operate and control that boat that nobody's on is through a radar that's mounted on the vessel. So the radar, in essence, is the eyes of the boat. It is perceiving the world in front of it in this at sea and sending that data back to a control room on land. And then that operator can make informed and logical decisions about how to navigate and control that boat at sea. This is also a groundbreaking capability. As we look at the future, there are so many applications where we can pull individuals, humans, out of dirty and dangerous jobs and substitute in machines. 
And this is a capability offering and value add to a number of defense arsenals. I want to reference very briefly here just some success stories in, in terms of C trials and demonstrations that we've done for this. What you see here is a screenshot of VStorm. I referenced Thunderstorm as our, as our stratospheric uh, command and control interface. VStorm is our command and control interface for radars. All the little dots that you see, everything that you see, this is a screenshot from our actual web-based application, VStorm. So this is a screenshot of what the radar is seeing. Me as the operator in a control room, this is what I would be looking at. I see the geography, I see the, la I see the land, I see the, the sea, I see the, the tracks that the radar is picking up. So all these little dots that you see are different things that the radar is picking up. So we did a sea trial over a year ago on an East Coast Bay during the noon, uh, the noon hour. Extremely high traffic. You've got uh, buoys, you've got commercial vessels, you've got fishing vessels, you've got a whole lot of obstacles, if you will, in this bay. And our, our, uh, the objective of our trial was to navigate autonomously, unmanned, to get a vessel from one end of the bay to the other, with nobody on board but our radar and other sensors communicating with each other, but the radar being the eyes for the boat, perceiving the world. So this is actually a screenshot, again, from our interface, but also from a video loop. I didn't want to attach the video. It's a large file. I would, it wouldn't be value add here, and I can speak to it, and I will here in just a moment. So when you watch this trial, what you see is you see our vessel with nobody on it but our radar starting to move from one end of the bay to the other. And as it comes across a buoy, it stops. The radar picks it up, and it does a donut around that buoy. And it continues to go on to the, end of the, to the end of the bay, and it sees a boat coming in the different direction, and it realizes that if it continues at that velocity, it would collide. So it stops, allows that boat to pass before continuing again. Then it sees another boat, and it stops, lets that boat pass, and continues onward. So this radar, real time, is picking up tracks, sending it to an operator in a control room, not on the boat, and it is successfully navigating autonomously through a very high traffic bay. And at the end of the trial, we had successfully accomplished the mission of reaching point A to point B autonomously. This is groundbreaking, and we really are bullish on the opportunities here. Defense markets uh, and the defense agencies really can have a value-add solution when you talk about unmanned and autonomous capabilities. Now, Raven Aerostar is, is typically well-known for balloons. Uh, we invented the modern-day hot air balloon. We've been doing a lot with balloons over 60-plus years. But really, we are a leader in all things lighter than air. A perfect example of that is our tethered aerostat systems. So many people are not familiar with aerostats, and that's perfectly fine with us. Uh, so for those that are less familiar, when you think of an aerostat, think of the Goodyear blimp. But instead of being blue and yellow, it's just white. And instead of free-floating and flying through the air, it's actually tethered to the ground to a trailer in a stationary location. And instead of carrying people to watch golf tournaments, uh, it's actually carrying payloads of all different end uses, sizes, uh, very similar to our high-altitude balloon platforms. So with aerostats, you can carry a few hundred pounds to a few thousand feet and, and retain persistence over a fixed geographic region. So when I reference aerostats, that's what I'm talking about. We've been building these for years and years, and what we've done is taken our, our expertise in lighter-than-air ballooning and leveraged it for an adjacent uh, business market in aerostats. And we're one of the world leaders in providing aerostats for a number of commercial and defense applications. So a few things I want to reference when I talk aerostats here. One, as I mentioned, you have a balloon, the envelope. It looks a lot like a blimp or a dart. You have a tether, and then you have a trailer on the ground that's holding that down. Now, the tether that's connecting the balloon with the trailer is about the width of my pinky, in all honesty. Uh, but even though it's extremely thin, it is, it's crucial in the overall system. It's a fiber optic line. Uh, it has high resolution, uh, it has capabilities for passing high resolution data from the balloon back down to the ground, uh, whether it's imagery, whether it's video. Uh, it also runs power up and down, so you don't need to have a generator on this balloon and have a larger balloon to carry more weight. Power can just run right up and down through that tether to a, to a ground control station or a ground control generator. And even though that tether is really the width of my pinky, it's extremely strong and extremely robust and durable. The, the blend of material that makes up this tether is fashioned in a way, and it's proprietary, but it's fashioned in a way so that it actually strengthens under te tension and stress. So as upward winds blow this balloon into different directions, that tether's strengthening and becoming more strong in the midst of that, uh, in the midst of that stress. Another unique aspect here I want to reference with these, with these aerostats is the envelope itself. I referenced how thin the balloon uh, envelope material is. It's you know, less than a Ziploc bag. 
This is much thicker, but not by much. Uh, it's much thicker in relativity, but it really is not that much larger. It's a woven fabric that's extremely, it's proprietary, but it's extremely robust and durable. You know, if I were to shoot a BB gun at a, at a birthday balloon, uh, it would pop, and, and everybody would, would be sad that there's no more balloons at the birthday party. These aerostats are, are, are fashioned in a way where small arms gunfire doesn't have an adverse effect in the near term. So as you can imagine, these are, these are typically deployed in hostile environments. Uh, this, this picture that you see here is our TIFF 25K aerostat. TIFF stands for tethered inflated fin. 25K stands for 25,000 cubic feet of helium. That's the amount of helium that it can hold. These are deployed out in Afghanistan as we speak. We've been deploying these uh, on behalf of the US efforts abroad for, for nearly a decade now. That's a harsh environment. There's sand, it's extremely hot. These are durable systems. But as I mentioned, often these are connotated with defense applications. So people say, why wouldn't you just shoot down this aerostat if you can? Well, these aerostats have proven that small arms gunfire, dozens and dozens of holes in it at one time, does not adversely affect the near-term performance. The pressure on the inside of this balloon is not all that different than the pressure on the outside. And because it isn't a rubber material, it doesn't affect it if it has a few holes. So what you can do is you can continue to operate optimally for the short term until you can bring it down safely, patch it up, and deploy it back up. These are extremely robust platforms. As you can imagine, the payload by which you're attaching to these aerostats really drives the end use. Uh, and if I wanted to have persistent surveillance coverage, I could put up one of our radars, attach it to the, uh, to the aerostat. I could fly it to 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 feet and have extremely good visuals in terms of what is the persistent surveillance situational awareness over a fixed region. I could see for miles and miles based on the radar that I'm putting on there and based on the height of the aerostat. But although there are typically defense connotations, there are actually extremely, um, in my in my opinion, lucrative commercial applications for this as well. And, and, and so it's interesting when you start putting pen to paper and thinking about possible applications here. When I talk commercial applications, imagine a scenario where you have a rural community that has zero to low broadband or internet connectivity. You could attach two, three, four antennas to this balloon, launch it up to 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 feet, whatever the payload and weight and the altitude uh, you know, combination will, will um, support. And immediately, you've got coverage over a fixed geographic region that previously had 0% coverage. So there are, we're very bullish on the, on the opportunities and possibilities here in terms of the commercial market as well. And I share that just to kind of get your brains thinking about what can these be used for, because it isn't always so obvious on the forefront. One of the beauties, uh, I think, of, the, of this showcase of this conference is that it highlights and justifies South Dakota's position uh, as, a, as a leader in providing emerging technologies, not just to South Dakota, uh, but to the larger, the larger geographic region. Raven's mission as a whole is to solve great challenges, and Raven Aerostar's mission specifically is to connect, connect, protect, and save lives. And the only way that we can accomplish those missions is through our groundbreaking technology, and we have no intention of taking our foot off the, off the pedal uh, in terms of driving and continuing to innovate, continuing to ideate, uh, and, uh, and with that, uh, I would like to open it up for questions. I see two minutes and three seconds on here, so I may be able to get one in, uh, but I do just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for letting me speak. Uh, I want to thank SDN Communications for letting Raven contribute to this, uh, to this showcase. Uh, and with that, I think we have a first. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad you put in the, uh, the last level of applications. I think they're very important. Sure. But my question is, um, are there any limits to persistence? I mean. You know, in an environment where you're not shooting at your aerostats. Sure. Is there any limit to what? To persistence. Sure. So there's going to be weather um, restrictions. So based on, there's this, objectively speaking, there's an electrical thunderstorm coming in. You're going to want to bring this aerostat down. However, when these aerostats are deployed in the right environmental conditions, the persistence aspect is there. Okay, you've been easy on me. I'm not an engineer, so I appreciate the, no, the, the lack of technical questions. Thank you. Thank you so much.